excited to get to, to share with you again this morning. We're still working through this series on finding the Old Testament in the Gospel of John. I love the Gospel of John. I love the Old Testament. So this is like a class... Uh, Well, it makes sense that I'm teaching it because I decided <laughs> I like both of these. Let's put them together and have some fun. So if you've been in the series, this is the sixth Sunday that I've been able to teach it. And we're going to make some more progress as we go along. But right now we're just in John chapter two. But that's pretty good because we spent five weeks on John chapter one. And I think we only spend one week on John chapter two. So we're starting to pick up some speed. And uh, uh, fasten your seatbelt. John chapter 2, if you don't remember, John chapter 2, mainly two stories. You've got the wedding at Cana. And then you've got Jesus going to Jerusalem and clearing out the temple. The money changers and, and uh, um, the people selling all of the livestock and, and everything. So those are the two stories. Now, we need to look at those stories, but I want to pause for just a moment. The whole concept of Jesus going to a wedding is a pretty cool concept. I love this. I, when, I, when I preach weddings, which I don't do much anymore because of time and stuff, but, but back when I used to preach weddings, this is one of my favorite passages is because Jesus starts out. And I'd like us to look at it together. So we're going to take the text apart here. And I think through the wonders of our great tech crew, we have, look at that, we have the IPVO working today. So this is the story. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. Now that's north of Jerusalem in the area near the Sea of Galilee where Jesus was from. Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. Easy so far. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, um, they're out of wine. Now, let me add, wedding festivities back then could last for a week. So this is not like you know, gee, you never should have invited Uncle Ned. He's clearly going to drink half the wine himself. You know, you don't let Uncle Ned near the wine till the end of the party. No, this is a week-long festivity, and they've run out of wine. I do not have an Uncle Ned, so that was a safe illustration. I have an Uncle Ed. No, I don't have that either, okay? It was real safe. Um, Jesus... So, Jesus' mother says, they've no wine. Now, you also may be thinking, this seems another bit weird. Please understand, back then, um, uh, uh, wine was even more common to drink in some ways than water. Because wine, you generally knew, uh, whether it was alcoholic or non-alcoholic, but wine you generally knew was clean. Water, you never knew if it was clean or not. So a, a lot of people would, would drink fruit juice instead of, of um, stagnant, dirty water. But regardless, they've run out. Jesus says to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? Now that might seem rude to you that Jesus calls his mother woman, but in the original, that's not rude. That's, that's, that's just an endearing conversation. I Sometimes I walked at, Becky, by the way, is home ill this morning, and I doubt she's watching live stream, so I can really finally tell some stories. <laughs> Becky, um, uh, affectionately by me, when I'm talking to our dog, because Becky is not a dog person, I, you know, I, I used to try and encourage Becky to be known by some affectionate name by the dog. She refused that. She likes cats, not dogs. So we, meaning me and our dog, now just call Becky House Lady. <laughs> so this morning, I find Becky basically looking like death warmed over in the sense of being sick, not beauty. She was gorgeous. Death warmed over. 
but the dog is there at her feet. And I said, hello, Tizzy. Is house lady being nice to you? <laughs> That's not me being offensive to my wife. It was just a different way of referencing. Men out there, you can always call your wife house lady. <laughs> See if it works for you. <laughs> she's going to look at me and she's going to hey, house man, take out the trash. <laughs> um, and Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And I love this next verse. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. It's kind of like Jesus saying, mom, this is not my time to do this. Right. Just do what he tells you to. He's going to fix this. That is a sign she is a classic mother. My mom's not here either this morning. I can really get away with a lot. <laughs> Mark, do this for them. Mom, I don't have time. Just do whatever Mark tells you to. He's going to fix it. Now, there were six stone jars there for the Jewish rites of purification. They had to wash their hands all the time for just about everything. These jars are huge, stinking tall, big stone jars, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. By the way, that stone, remember that, stone water jars. John didn't have to say that, did he? Couldn't John have just said six water jars? Could have been clay? Could have just said six clay jars? But he says six stone water jars. Remember that. Okay, what are you going to remember? Stone jars, but y'all are good. Okay, there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. They filled them to the brim. And he said, now draw some out, take it to the master of the feast. That's like the wedding planner. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine. He didn't know where it would come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The master of the feast calls the bridegroom. And he says to him, what gives? Everybody serves the good wine first. And then when people have enjoyed it and commented on it and are happy, they serve the junk. But you've kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And the disciples believed in him. Now again, John doesn't have to say first of his signs, but he does. John doesn't have to say manifested his glory, but he does. What I want us to do is I want us to read slowly because there's some stuff in here that we're going to want to unpack. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, <clears throat> Jesus tells them what to do. They fill it to the brim. And they change, the water changes into wine by a miracle of Jesus. Now, immediately from that story, Jesus goes to Capernaum for a verse, but then it says it's Passover. He goes down and he cleans out the temple. And if you're just reading along John, it looks like these two disjointed stories. That's just kind of the narrative of what's happening on Jesus' journey. But I want you to see it as more than two disjointed stories. I don't want it to be the kind of thing where you read it. You say, okay, I read it. I read it with Mark and uh, got a little bit more out of it maybe than I would have otherwise. But hey, I'm done. Got those two. Let's move on. After all, it looks pretty simple. Look at the cleaning of the temple story. This starts in verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. By the way, Jesus is north of Jerusalem and he goes down to go up. 
Scripture always talks about going up to Jerusalem because it's at the top of a hill. So you go up. Whether you're coming from the south, north, east, or west, you go up. When I was a, a younger nerd, <laughs> they used to bother me. It's kind of like, well, he didn't go up. He went down. That was south. Okay. You go up to Jerusalem. In the temple, Jesus found those who were selling oxen, sheep, and pigeons. Now that makes sense because you need to sacrifice. That's part of Passover. That's part of the temple process, even apart from Passover. There are daily sacrifices. So you've got people who are selling oxygen, oxen, sheep, and pigeons. Sorry, oxygen. <laughs> And then you've got money changers sitting there. Well, money changers are important. You've got to have the right coinage to pay your temple taxes. You might have to have the right coinage to buy certain animals. People are coming from all over. People would not only be coming from Galilee and the Jewish environment, but you've got people coming from Rome. You've got Jews scattered throughout the Mediterranean world. And they don't just have little cards. You know, they didn't take Apple iPay. They've got, they've got to pay in the currency. So they have money changers who are there saying, what do you got? Oh, you got a Roman shekel? You need a Tiberian silver piece. I tell you what, you give me two Roman shekels, I'll give you one Tiberian silver piece. And then the person would say, well, wait a minute, that guy offered me one for just one and a half. Say, yeah, but that guy's Tiberian shekel, who knows where it came from? And mine is good. This is the stuff that was going on. This is real life stuff. And it makes sense within the, the, the concept of what they're doing. So the people selling these things are sitting there. Now Jesus makes a whip of cords. And he drives them all out of the temple, the sheep and the oxen. You know, you say, was he whipping people with the cords? I doubt it. I don't see that. I think if he's got the cords and those are their sheep and oxen and he starts going, hey, 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 getting them out of there and he drives out the sheep and oxen, I promise you the people who owned them are running after him. Wait. <clears throat> and he told those who sold the pigeons. See, they were in baskets. You, you don't just drive them out. Take these things away. Don't make my father's house a house of trade. There's a good pun in the Greek there. Don't make the oikos uh, of my father, the house of my father, a, a, a marketplace, a, uh, 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 an emporium. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews say to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews said, it's taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days. But Jesus was speaking about the temple of his body, which by the way, they would destroy. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he'd said this. They believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Again, you've got a basic story. And you can read that story and you can be at peace and you can go on down the road and hit John chapter 3, get ready for Nicodemus and God so loved the world. But that's not fair. You see, there's more to the story than meets the eye. And what's below the surface of this story, can we go back to the PowerPoint? What's below the surface of this story might surprise you. If you're only looking at the tree, you're missing this massive root system that's underneath. You're seeing the fruit, you're seeing the obvious, but if, if we've got to dig to see the foundations and the supports and the things that gives it meaning. So that's what we're going to do this morning over the next 25 minutes, if you'll join me in that. 
So within our 35, within the framework of this, we've got to stay in the flow of John if we're going to understand this. Now we're only in John chapter 2, but already we've seen several streams of thought that are in John. First of all, let me suggest to you that what John is doing is what we would call in Hebrew a Torah pesher. Torah means the law, in, in HaTorah is the law. Torah is law in Hebrew. That's the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Pesher is a Hebrew word for a commentary. Now, I'm really stoked the next time I get to talk to my friend Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, because N.T. Wright is emphatic that John is rewriting Genesis. <clears throat> Tom has got, Tom Wright, who by the way is like 50 times the biblical scholar I am, maybe 100 times, so this is really presumptuous what all I'm going to say, but I'm a lawyer and by nature I'm presumptuous and so I can do it anyway. What's he going to do? Sue me? Oh no, he's not a lawyer. Looks like he won't. So within the framework of that, I'm going to engage our friend Tom Wright and try to see if he's willing to modify his vocabulary a little bit. And instead of teaching that John is rewriting Genesis, which begins in the beginning and John begins in the beginning and da-da-da-da-da, instead see this as John's writing a commentary on Genesis and the larger Torah. He's writing a pesher. He's writing an explanation of how that has been fulfilled in Jesus by the hand of God. And so he quotes from and he references from the Torah, from those books. But not because he's rewriting it. There was nothing wrong with it the first time. He's writing it because he's teaching on it. He's explaining it. He's giving it a commentary. And in the process of doing that, he's laid out various themes. And one of the themes that he's laid out is that Jesus is the greater one that Moses had prophesied would come. Jesus is the other prophet that Moses references in Deuteronomy 18.15 when Moses said that God would send from among the Israelites one like Moses, but even greater. So Jesus is the greater one, and John's already made that clear. So he started his commentary on Genesis, and his commentary on Genesis, we've read already how it's in the beginning. We've read already that Jesus is the light. We've read already that Jesus is life. We've read already even the calling of Nathaniel weaves in an understanding, as we talked last week, of Jacob and his, his dream of the ladder and the angels ascending and descending. But within the framework of that, he's also, John's also said that you got the law through Moses, but grace and truth came from Jesus. And so here is Jesus who stands in the stream of Moses, but as one greater than Moses. Then another stream that we've been following the flow of is that Jesus is where God meets with us. So that's that John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt is tabernacled, pitched its tent. The tabernacle in the wilderness that, that God told Moses to have built. And God said, you carry that tabernacle around, you build that tabernacle everywhere you stop, and I will meet the people at the tabernacle. People aren't allowed in there. But my presence will descend. And that's the meeting place. That's where God meets with his people. Israel was unique in the instructions God gave in the Torah through Moses. All other cultures 
had multiple temples to multiple gods, but also multiple temples to the same God. Every town wanted to have a temple to, to, their, to the local deities. And don't think that you just have to go to Mount Olympus to find a temple that the Greeks had built to Zeus. You'll find a temple to Zeus all over the place. That's like saying, is there going to be just one church? We got churches all over the place. But not so Israel. Israel was instructed, you're to have one tabernacle and I will meet you at that one place. There is one place I will meet Israel. Don't build temples everywhere. Don't build tabernacles everywhere. There is one. And when that tabernacle passed, it passed to the temple that Solomon built in Jerusalem. But that was the temple. And people were going up. Even Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. He doesn't go to his local temple for Passover. We need to understand that's a very, very rare view. It's unique. It's Israel's. And the reason why is because as John is saying, there is one meeting place where God meets with humanity and deals with our sin and establishes a relationship. And only one. That's Jesus. So Jesus is the tabernacle. Jesus is where God meets with us. And then we've also had within the flow of this that Jesus is the source of life. In him is life. So all of those flows, life of course is what God breathed into Adam and Eve. Life comes from Jesus. That's the flow. So now that we've got the flow, we've got the basic stories, I want to do three things with you. I want to talk about the wedding in more detail, digging into it a little bit. I want to talk about the cleansing of the temple, digging into it a little bit. And I want to talk to you about what you take home today. Let's do the wedding first. We looked at it in John 2, 1 through 11. But let's broaden our perspective of weddings a little bit. Weddings are, weddings can be one of the most marvelous events there is. Love weddings. Weddings are that incredible occasion that speak to love, that speak to family, that speak to commitment, that speak to hope for the future. I... Weddings, I'll tell you this, as a lawyer, I've been to many weddings, I've preached many weddings. I've also seen many people at divorce court. It's the exact opposite. Weddings are all the hope and the joy. Divorce court is just the agony of something that was hoped to be beautiful being torn up. And you can understand something by its beauty, you can also understand something by its loss. And from both vantage points, the idea of a good and holy marriage and a wedding is an amazing thing. And so when we look at weddings within the Bible, we've got some incredible illustrations of how weddings are God being involved in the uniting of a husband and wife. And so you've got the first wedding is Adam and Eve. And God's clearly responsible for that. I mean, he's matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. Find me a fine, pull out my rib. Um, <clears throat> this, this is God directly saying that humanity is not normally fit. And that doesn't mean you're abnormal if you're not that way. But within the scope of the odds, I mean, Paul makes it real clear. God made some people for marriage. He made some people not for marriage. So we never, ever want to suggest that being single is less than fulfilling of God and his humanity. There are no little people and there are, God has made no little people. So if you're, if you're married and that's your calling and that's what God's put in your life, you understand it is a gift from God. If you're single and that's what God's put in your life, 
then that is your calling from God and that is a gift from God. But for Adam, it was not good that he be alone. So God made Eve for him. And that's the first wedding. You say, who officiated it? God. That's good enough. He's licensed in all states. <laughs> there's a second big wedding in the Bible. Well, there's a bunch along the way. But did you know that when God calls Israel to Sinai, that the whole process of what unfolds on Mount Sinai of God and his people is a Jewish wedding? It's a covenant. It is a wedding covenant where God says, okay, I've called you forth. I'm paying for this event. I am going to take care of you. And here's what I'm going to do for you. And you and I will join together if you will do so. And Israel says, I do. That's why the story of Hosea, the prophet Hosea, is so profoundly allegorical to Israel. Because Hosea represents God in the story. And his wife, Gomer, represents Israel. And she goes off playing the, the unfaithful wife. The adulterous wife. Which is what Israel was doing to God. And that's what God's saying. Well, Israel could only be an adulterous wife if Israel was married to God to start with. That's the relationship. And that relationship is set up in the Torah. That relationship is described in the Torah. Remember, John's writing a commentary on the Torah. As he has Jesus at this wedding. Let me give you another one. There's a book nestled in the Old Testament called the Song of Songs. Also called the Song of Solomon. The Song of Songs is a wedding story. It's a story, poems. It's a collection of poems of a husband-to-be and a wife. It is a, it is a marvelous unfolding of a beautiful, loving relationship. That's one of heart, one of mind, and one of body. And that book rings all of those bells. And you can find in that book marvelous descriptions from the heart and the mind and the body of both the bride and the groom. By the way, did you know at the time of Jesus attending the wedding at Cana? One of the things that was done at a wedding was singing the Song of Songs. That was part of the wedding. That's one of the times that it was sung. So within the framework of that, we'll come back to that again in more in a minute. There's another way. By the time John writes his gospel, which he's writing from Ephesus, to a church that three decades later had first started absorbing and learning and reading and teaching from Paul's book we call Ephesians, his letter. And in Ephesians 5, 31 through 32, the church getting John's gospel would have been very familiar with this understanding. Paul is talking about how husbands and wives should treat each other. And he says, A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And look what he says next. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. Paul's got his own little commentary running on Genesis. And Paul says it's a profound mystery, but it's true that just as Israel was the bride to God on Sinai. So in the ultimate fulfillment of the Torah, God's people, the church, God's people are the bride of the Messiah, their Savior. 
we go back to the PowerPoint, please. Thank you. So this is another wedding set. And it's carried forward by John, not only in his gospel, but in the revelation of John as well. In Revelation chapters 19 and 20, at the end of time, John is writing that the church has been adorned as a bride and that Christ comes and there's a wedding feast that God has prepared for the marriage of the bride and, his, and, and her groom. It should send a tingle down your spine. I got to tell you something. I'm going to digress and tell you one of the events I had this week. I was meeting with a bunch of experts up in Boston. And one of the experts I met with, uh, she's like really, 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 really bright. Now, I'm not suggesting I met with any that were dull. So if any of them are watching, you were all just marvelously bright. But this one woman, she's like, like really bright, like umpteen gazillion degrees, like just bright through the, bright through the roof. Okay. So I said to her, I said, well, you meet someone who's, who's got truly more degrees than a thermometer. I mean, this woman's got like, <laughs> you meet someone like that and, and she's got kids and she's got uh, uh, all of these other things going on and you just wonder if she's got time for anything else in her life. So I said to her, I said, well, I'm just real curious. Do you have time for anything else in your life? She said, what do you mean? I said, do you do anything other than your profession and your family? And she said, well, I do like to read. And I said, I love to read. Tell me what you read. This brilliant, bright, incredible woman confesses to me that she reads cheap romance novels. <laughs> I'm like, really? I thought you were going to tell me like, you know, yeah, yeah, something classic like the history of Lubbock or, you know, one of these <laughs> things that can change your world. And um, <clears throat> she said, uh, uh, yeah, she said, I do. but you think about romance novels. They sell. People love romance. They stick it in movies. Not the classics, but even some of the classic movies. Like Rocky had Adrian. <laughs> you, see, you see romance stirs up within us a desire, uh, 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 an attraction. We love it. One of the five best movies ever made is Princess Bride. True love is a tremendous thing. There's nothing more powerful. Now, the reason I pause for a moment and I say this is because what you get from weddings is, if you understand it right, all of the hope, all of the love, all of the commitment, all of the family, all of the, if it's done right and proper and nurtured and taken care of for ever, all of those things are deeply knit within our relationship with God. Our relationship with God is a love relationship that should have all of the charm and all of the attraction of any romance novel you'll ever want to read and more. But God engages us with commitment. He engages us with family. He engages us with true love. All of that is knit and he wants us to understand through the dynamic of human love and a human marriage and a human relationship that we're getting a thumbnail of the glory of what he wants in his relationship with us. And that's the reason the Song of Solomon was sung in weddings at the time. That changed after the destruction of the temple, by the way. Rabbi Akiva, uh, 
contemporary of, of Paul's and, and others, first century rabbi, I think he was born around 50 AD, um, whoever trills his voice, la, 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 and shows off the voice in the Song of Songs at the marriage festivities and makes it into kind of a secular carol, has no share in the world to come. Because it's not a secular carol, it's a love story. The early church was struggling to understand what a lurid thing like the Song of Songs would be doing in the Bible. And if you read it, it's got lurid parts, okay? They were saying like, wait, this can't be in here. He's describing parts of her body we're not allowed to name, and yet it's in the Bible, you know? And, and so you, you're reading it that way, and, and, and the early church is reading it that way, and they understood it to be a love story of God and his people, and that's what it is. And if you treat it as anything less, then you're not treating it fairly. So it's at this wedding where Jesus changes the water into wine. Now that's a really cool thing that happens. Remember I said we're in the stream of John commenting on the Torah. And he's commented on a number of things so far. He's given commentary on it. Look at Moses in the Torah. Moses confronts God at the bush that's burning but not being consumed. And Moses says to God, okay, if I'm going to do all of this, I got to tell him who you are. So what's your name? And God says, my name is Yahweh. And I want you to go reveal me to the people and call them out of Egypt. They're my people. I want you to go reveal me to them and call them out. And so Moses does so. And they come out. Now, Moses walks with the people for the rest of his life till the last few days. But at the end, Moses tells the people something very important. He says, Yahweh. Your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, and it's to whom you shall, it is to him you shall listen. Now, that had not happened by the time the, the, the Torah was being put into its final form. We know that because after Moses is gone and dead, at the end of the Torah, it says, there's not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom Yahweh knew face to face. Although even that was the back of God's face, not the front. Because God said to Moses, you can't see my glory and live. So that's what we've got. But now we've got John who's come along and in his commentary on Genesis, is, uh, on the Torah, is saying that in John 1.1, 1, 1, we read it as, and the word was with God. But the true Greek of that is, the word is face to face. It's toward God. It's pros to theo. It's ton theon. It's, it's, I don't remember if it's accusative or genitive, so... I think it's accusative, but it doesn't matter. It's the, I'm only saying that because someone's going to watch this who knows Greek grammar extremely well, and I don't want to get that email. Okay, it may be ton theon, it may be tous theu, I, whichever it is, tous theu, whichever it is, singular. All right, so Moses can see the back of God's face, but Jesus is face to face with God because he is God. He is that prophet, and John wants you to know that. John doesn't want there to be any doubt in your mind that Jesus is that prophet. John adds in verse 18, No one has ever seen God, the only God, who's at the Father's side has made him known. In other words, Jesus, the only God, has made him known. God himself has made himself known because within the complexity of this being we call God, somehow exist three persons in this one being. And within that complexity, Sergio, you'll read it in the book, within that complexity, Jesus is 
the one who has seen God face to face. Now, that's not the only place John's making this allusion, this, this uh, alluding to this. Look at it side by side. Moses goes down to reveal God, and what's he do in Egypt? He does the plagues, right? All right, quiz time, Bible, trivia. First plague. Ooh, Hank, ding, 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 ding. He's seen the movie. Water to blood. <laughs> Charlton Heston. Bam! Now, that happens in Exodus, I think it's chapter 7. Let's see if I'm close to right. If not, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Look at this. Okay. Exodus 7, 14. By the way, do y'all remember what I told you not to forget earlier? Stone. Thank you. Stone jars. Got it. Appreciate it. The Lord Yahweh says to Moses, Pharaoh's heart's hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he was going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him. Take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent, and you'll say to him, Yahweh, God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go so they can serve me in the wilderness. But so far, page turn, you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you'll know I'm Yahweh. Behold, with the staff that's in my hand, I'm going to strike the water that's in the Nile, and it's going to turn to blood. The fish in the Nile will die. The Nile's going to stink. The Egyptians are going to grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, take your staff, stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over their rivers, canals, ponds, all of their pools of waters, so that they may become blood, and there'll be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and vessels of stone. And Moses does so. If we go back to the PowerPoint. So Moses turns the water to blood even in vessels of stone. Now John tells you that this is Jesus' first miracle to align with the first plague. And in this first miracle, Jesus turns water into wine, even in the stone jar. And what's more, wine, according to the Torah, is the blood of the grape. But there's a distinction between Jesus turning water into wine, blood of the grape, and Moses turning water into blood, or God doing it through Moses. The distinction is, when Moses did it, it caused the fish to stink, it, or the Nile to stink. It killed the fish, and it made the people sick. When Jesus did it, it brought life to the party. It was the richest, the best, the tastiest, the joy-giving. And John doesn't want you to miss that comparison. John's giving you a commentary on Genesis. You got it? Let's take a brief moment and look at the temple. So the temple story, we read it in John 2, 13 through 22. It specifically happens during the time of Passover. Now, Passover is again found in the Torah. This is again commentary on the Torah. This is a Torah pesher. And so within the framework of the Torah pesher, the commentary on the Torah, here comes the story of the Passover. It's the last plague. So we've got, by the way, in John chapter 2, a mirror of the first plague, water to wine, and a bookend on the back end of the back plague, the Passover. So the Passover, the lamb is sacrificed and the door is put over the top and the sides of the door in the shape of a cross. And John's telling this story. And remember, we got chapter divisions. He didn't put them in there. So this is just really about 15, 18, 20 some odd verses away from Jesus being the Lamb of God. 
which I think denotes more than just a Passover lamb, but it certainly calls forth the Passover lamb. And so God says, I'm going to take the firstborn of everything and everyone in Egypt except those who are covered by the blood of the lamb and they will live. And that's the Passover. And so if we look at it and we compare Moses to Jesus, Moses calls out the Passover, Pesach in Hebrew. Moses calls forth the Pesach. Moses tells the people, get the lamb, slay the lamb, paint the blood, and then be in your house protected by the blood of the lamb when the angel of death passes over. And he'll pass over your house. So that's the story. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, is the Lamb of God. He is the Pesach. He is the Passover. He's got every right in the world to go down to, or up to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover. And when he sees what's going on there, put a stop to it. And the people say, what right do you have? Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus isn't saying simply, hey, this is it. Sacrifices are over. Get the sacrifices out of here. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is there's a place for this, and it's not inside the temple courts. Get outside. Because this is not supposed to be a place where you're cutting the best deals with other people and you're making money off of them. Worshiping the Lord is not supposed to be a money-making experience. Be wary of anybody who's hawking you faith with a handout for your pocketbook. I love the fact that we worship at a church where people are taught to give out of the generosities of their heart and not because they're owed, they, they, they are obligated. Nothing, you, you, God never sold his gospel. You didn't have to buy a ticket to attend the feeding of the 5,000 or the Sermon on the Mount. But if you were a boy and you had the fish and the loaves, you could donate them. That was good. So Moses then, God instructs Moses after the Passover, build the tabernacle. John has already told us Jesus is the tabernacle, but now he goes a step further. And if they're going to build the tabernacle, he tells us Jesus is not just the tabernacle. Jesus is also the temple. And so that should say Jesus is the temple. Jesus is not just the early meeting place of God with his people. He's what was built afterwards. He is the place where the sacrifices are given that cause God and his people to be in harmony. He is the one who is the singular meeting place between humanity and God. That's the lesson John wants us to have. He wants us to see that. Now, before we get to points for home, can I tell you one more thing you may not know about Passover? Ricky, where are you? You may know this. Well, I've got some more Jewish folks in here who may know this. But did you know Passover? One of the things in the liturgy of Passover that's read, Song of Solomon. Because it's a love story. And the Passover is a love story. It's God seeking out and securing his bride. So Jesus had, I mean, John put together two stories, two events. Wedding, where the Song of Solomon lies, and Passover, where the Song of Solomon is sung. Because this is the love story that is John. This is the love story that's the commentary of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Torah. So with that as an understanding of this John chapter 2, what are we going to take home? I start with this. Embrace your groom. There is a love story. God has a heart for you, to use a human term. God desires you. God wants an embrace with you. 
He wants you to know that his is not, uh, this is not a God of simple task, rules, harshness, meanness, sternness. This is a God of moral character that cannot be changed. He has a moral fiber that is inherent to his being that can't be changed. And that includes justice. But it's a God who wants you so badly for himself that he will pay the ultimate price for you because otherwise he'd never get you. He not only made us, he has redeemed us and bought us with a price. And so we need to embrace it. The two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. It refers to Christ and his church. God is seeking his people. And I want to embrace that. Point for home number two. I want to meet God in Jesus. That's the one meeting place. I can do the best I can do. I'm never going to be good enough for God. I can live the most devoted life I can live. I'm never going to be good enough for God. We as a church need to stand for the principle that we meet God in Jesus. And if I expect perfection from any of you, what have I done? I've made the cross of Jesus worth nothing. Because he didn't have to die. You ought to be good enough on your own. If I hold you to such a high standard that you are not allowed to make mistakes in your life, what have I done? I've made the cross of Christ. I have nullified, to use Paul's terminology in Galatians, the grace of God. But that's what we've got. Jesus said, you destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. The temple is where God meets with his people. And it is the resurrection of Jesus that affirms for us we do meet with God eternally and forgiven. He took our sins. I got to tell you, point for home number three, and then we'll move, but it applies to point for home number two. Point for home number three is keep digging because I really didn't get into everything that John 2 has to offer. Do you know what I left out? Big left out. His disciples remembered it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. That comes from Psalm 69. Next to Psalm 22, Psalm 69 is the most quoted psalm in the Bible, in the New Testament. And it's referencing Jesus over and over and over again. But part of that is a reference to the fact, in fact, the, the verse continues that that, that verse out of Psalm 69 continues, zeal for your house will consume me and the insults of those who insult you will be mine. Jesus took on our sin. He died in our stead. That's the ultimate love story. Greater love has no one than to give their life up for another. That's Jesus. This love story continues with the Old Testament in John chapter 3. I'm stoked to get there with you. We're through today. Let me bless you in the name of Jesus, and I'll see you, God willing, next Sunday. Father, in the name of Jesus, the temple, the meeting place, we come to you washed clean by the blood, passed over as we sit beneath the Lamb of God. And we embrace you with the feeble best efforts we can in love in appreciation stir up within our hearts this love for you father blow on the embers that may be cold for some inflame us with the, the passion of devotion to you in this relationship you've secured for us. Amen.